Good evening. Welcome to our annual How Lecture. I'm Ann Mason. I'm Minister of First Parish in Lexington. And I'm delighted to welcome you to what promises to be an incredible evening. Good evening. Welcome. Tonight, we will hear a dialogue between two leading voices in American political commentary. If you are wondering why a Unitarian Universalist church is offering such an evening, it is because we are a people who actively promote the values that we uphold, one of them being the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Our denomination has a storied history supporting free speech, unfettered voting rights, and an educated populace. We respect learning from many perspectives about the rights and the responsibilities of being a part of democracy. Tonight's, being present, tonight's presentation is being recorded and can be found on Lex Media and on the First Parish YouTube channel and on Facebook Live. So please feel free to share this event widely. Welcome, I am so glad that you are here. And now I'd like to introduce our Minister Emerita, the Reverend Helen Cohen. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you also to the Howe Lecture Committee who organized this exciting program, John Oberturfer, Debbie Armstrong, Jan Bjorklin, Marty Qual, and David Horton, to our church administrator, Pratik Montora, to our tech support, Jermaine Jaunty and Pete Tasker, to Lex Media for broadcasting and taping this interview. And a special welcome and thank you to the members of the Howe family for initiating and supporting the Howe Lecture Series. Elizabeth Howe was a beloved member of First Parish and of the Lexington community. Teacher, counselor, daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, she was warm and wise and generous. And she was a dedicated educator in every sense. When she died in 1991, friend protested but she was part of the building. And I think many of us felt that way about her. In 1991, Betty's family established the Elizabeth Howe Lecture Fund in her honor with First Parish to carry on her legacy with lectures on issues of importance to the community, the nation and the world. Over the years, the fund has sponsored a series of deeply informative, engaging and inspiring presentations on a wide range of issues. Betty's legacy and spirit live on. This evening, we're blessed with a dialogue between Peter Fenn and Jesse Wegman on the history and value of the Electoral College in the United States, a vital issue at this time of struggle over our elective procedures in the states and in the nation, over the role of the Electoral College for our founders and over its current effect on how our country chooses its president. Peter Fenn has been involved in the national government since the late 1950s he worked in campaigns for John F. Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, and Frank Church. He was a page in the U.S. Senate and served on the Senate Intelligence Committee. In the early 80s, he started the Center for Responsive Politics, Open Secrets, and in the late 80s, he founded Fenn Communications Group, working for progressive organizations. He's a strategist, analyst, consultant, and television commentator. Welcome, Peter. And Jesse Wegman is a writer, editor, and producer. He's worked for National Public Radio, The Daily Beast, Newsweek, Reuters, and The New York Observer. Since 2013, he's been a member of the editorial board of The New York Times, where he researches and writes about legal issues and the Supreme Court. In June of 2020, he published the book, Let the People Pick the President, the case for abolishing the Electoral College. Welcome, Jesse. Peter will be interviewing Jesse about his study of the Electoral College and responding on the basis of his own experiences. If you are watching this presentation tonight on Zoom, you, say, you may submit a brief question for Jesse or Peter. It will be answered at some time during the presentation if time allows. To submit a question, click on the chat icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, type in the question and direct it to everyone. I have a couple more things to say. For those in the audience who are members of First Parish, 
it is a particular delight that both speakers have family ties to the church. Peter is the son of Dan Fenn, another beloved church member for many, many years who died this past fall. Peter went to Sunday school at the church and he says that his father's example of national and local political involvement started him on his career. Jesse is the grand nephew of Betty Howe. And he thinks that his love of storytelling and education may have begun in the many hours on his aunt's porch, Betty's porch on Chandler Street in Lexington, listening to Betty and his mother, her sister, Isabel. Welcome, Peter and Jesse. Peter. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I do have very fond memories of, uh, of being at the First Parish Church as a young boy in the 50s and, and uh, those wonderful candlelight services, which I think still go on, uh, which would truly light up the church and light up all our lives. And it's, a, it's just an incredible pleasure for me to be here with Jesse, uh, who has written, I think, uh, one of the really most important books, uh, uh, not only about the past and, and where we've come from, but about the future, uh, the future of our democracy. And, uh, and uh, I, I told folks beforehand that not only would I hold this book up, but sometimes I'd put it in front of my face so that you know something really good was up on the screen. But the, the, the book is, uh, is, is terrific and I'm so happy to, to be here with Jesse to talk about it tonight. I will just say one thing uh, about uh, my, my dad's background, which as many of you know, he, uh, he loved Lexington. And uh, you know, he taught us to love Lexington, all of us kids. But the, one of the memories that I have as a young boy, 12 years old, was uh, coming out and, and being in front of the church on, on election eve 1960 and there were buses there to take a bunch of us down to the boston garden to, to hear president kennedy and my dad was you know everybody was nervous i mean they weren't sure which way this one was going to go but my dad was always a good predictor and he said we're going to have a really great president tomorrow and a lot of us look back on that, you know, in, in, in our old age with, uh, with a, a great deal of, uh, of, uh, of respect and, and, and love for my dad. So um, I want to just turn it to Jesse to give, uh, give a basic uh, uh, outline of the book and uh, the, the, the important points that he made. And then we'll go back and forth and I'll ask questions and make you know, maybe make a few comments. So, uh, Jesse, I think uh, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much to the church, to Reverend Mason and to Reverend Emerita Cohen uh, for welcoming, welcoming me here uh, for this conversation. I'm honored to be asked to, to take part. I, I know that um, uh, uh, as, as uh, Reverend Emerita uh, Cohen said, my uh, connection to Betty goes back to my very earliest uh, years, and to those are my very first memories of was was playing in her house and sitting on her porch uh, with my extended family, and um, I remember every inch of that house inside and out. Uh, even today, you know, 30 years or so after she's passed away, so it's it's really nice to still be able to be connected to her community. I I I, th I believe I attended one of the the first, if or or at least one of the first of the How lectures back in the 90s. And then um, I know I moderated a lecture <clears throat> maybe six or seven years ago on criminal justice reform. So I feel like I've slowly been climbing the ladder here and now get to uh, uh, actually be the speaker at, at, at this lecture series. And I'm, and I'm honored and I'm thrilled and, and I'm really happy to be doing this with Peter. Uh, it's really, it's really, I love talking about this subject with anybody, but it's especially nice to be talking about it with people who've been so deeply immersed in politics uh, for, for a long time, because there's so much that um, I learned and didn't know at all when I started this book. And uh, a, a lot of what I learned came from both political scientists, uh, people in the academy, but also people 
uh, on the ground, people who, who do politics for a living and people who spend their lives trying to figure out how to win elections. Uh, the last chapter of my book is basically just interviews with them. <clears throat> and it's in, in a way, it was the most fun uh, chapter to write because it was really putting, putting the theories and all of the history and all of the statistics that precede the, that chapter to the test. Um, so as Peter said, uh, I think I'll give you a, uh, a book report, as it were, uh, a short uh, synopsis of, of my argument. Um, I'll try to hit as many of the essential points as I can. I'm going to miss some of them, I know, but I also know that uh, Peter will, will make sure to, to get me back on track when we have our conversation. And I also look forward to uh, questions uh, from the audience, which I think I've, I've, I've found over this past year of talking about this subject with um, audiences that are always enlightening and I think always help to deepen the, the conversation and the understanding. So here's what I'll say uh, to, to, just as a very, uh, very simple uh, frame for this entire conversation and for the book, which is two points worth remembering more than anything else. One, the Electoral College was not adopted for the reasons that you think it was. And two, the Electoral College does not operate today the way that you think it does. Uh, these are um, you know, perhaps uh, a little bit um, provocative claims, uh, but I, I hope to convince you uh, that they're both absolutely true and not only true, but uh, important for us to uh, take heed of if we're going to think uh, more deeply about how we as a nation founded on certain principles of equality, democracy, and inclusion are going to go about choosing our nation's leader. So let's start with the past. Um, the, the Electoral College was not adopted for the reasons you think it was. I think there's a little bit of uh, deprogramming that has to happen here. I think a lot of us learned in school, uh, in our civics classes or in government class that, you know, the 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 Constitutional Convention was this, you know, solemn meeting of several scores of, of men uh, who were some of the, 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 you know, the brightest political minds of their generation or of any generation, uh, and who and who came together at this, you know, fraught moment for this young country. Uh, it, it could have gone either way, right? In the summer of 1787, um, they were, you know, still, <laughs> yeah, you know, they were still in just the, the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, and they're trying to figure out how to run a country. Uh, the Articles of Confederation had been in effect for a few years at that point. They were an utter disaster. Uh, and so these men all gather to meet in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 <clears throat> to uh, at first, they think just you know tweak the Articles of Confederation, but it very quickly becomes clear that that's not going to be sufficient. They need a complete overhaul. They need to create a new government. And one of the things they needed, which they realized they did not have under the Articles of Confederation, was a president. And so the question immediately arises: Well, how do you choose that person? How do you choose the leader of a country that is made up of independent states? Uh, and so that was a debate that began in the first week of the convention, and it carried through the entire summer. It went on for four months. It was probably the most vexing question that the delegates faced. They did not come to a resolution that they could all agree to on how to choose the president until the very final days of the convention. It was done in a side room of the convention hall by a few delegates huddled over a piece of parchment with a quill. <laughs> And they basically just hammered out what something that could get the Constitutional Convention finished and get the Constitution signed and sent off to the states for ratification. They were tired, they were hot, they were irritable, they'd been fighting with each other all summer long, and they just wanted to get out of there. So I think it's really important to remember that this you know, supposedly um, careful, brilliant design that we all were taught about uh, when we were kids or in, you know, in our teenage years is actually a lot more complicated than that. It was not a uh, deeply thought out, brilliant design. It was a, a sort of last minute jerry-rigged solution to a problem that nobody could solve uh, uh, you know, 
comfortably in the months before. Why couldn't they solve that problem? Why was it so hard? They, they debated a lot of pretty touchy issues at the convention. We're gonna talk about a number of those, um, but why was this one in particular so hard? Well, there's, there, there are some obvious answers to that. One is of course, they had just literally fought a war of independence to, uh, to be free of a tyrannical monarch who was ruling them from across the ocean. They were very wary of setting up another tyrant on their own shores. They did not wanna let that happen. So they had to think about, well, how do we choose a leader in a way that doesn't uh, create the situation we just escaped from? Um, the sort of baseline assumption was, we'll have Congress choose the president. That was, uh, James Madison you know, introduced the first draft of, of what would become the constitution called the Virginia Plan. Uh, early in the convention, and it included a provision by which uh, Congress would choose the president. Well, some, some of the delegates there thought that was a good idea. Others were adamantly opposed to it. They said, wait a minute, we're creating a new government here, and one of the essential components of that government, one of the essential values of it, is a separation of powers. That, that is crucial to its functioning. And if you have one branch picking the leader of the other branch, that's not a separation of powers. That's gonna make the president completely dependent on Congress for his job. And you're not gonna have a real separation there. And then you're going to have the kinds of corruption and the kind of cabal that I think they were, they were actively trying to avoid. So the debate goes on and on throughout the summer. Will Congress do it? No. Will the state governors do it? Will the state legislatures do it? Con everybody's fighting, everybody's coming up with different ideas. One delegate, uh, James Wilson, uh, whom I have found uh, to my surprise, I had not known about and most people I speak to hadn't known about, but was in, in actuality perhaps the most important framer at the convention. Uh, he was a Scottish immigrant who had come to America in his early 20s and was by far the most democratic visionary delegate of all of them. He says in the very first days of the convention, the president should be elected directly by the people. Now, obviously at that time, the, who the people were <laughs> was a very different uh, uh, group of group than it is today. Uh, the people then were considered, you know, largely, uh, it was all men, um, almost all white, and uh, usually uh, in most states, uh, wealthy property owning men. Uh, men like the men uh, at the convention, the delegates of the convention. Nevertheless, he saw a kind of dem democratic quality to this country that they were trying to create and a necessity to elect leaders in that manner that I think none of the other framers were quite willing to adopt. Uh, and that was shown by the fact that none of them agreed with him when he said the president should be elected by the president, uh, by the people directly. So the summer goes on, the debates go on, uh, and one of the concerns that I think was a legitimate one, and I think it's one we've all heard, is this, it, it wasn't really the fear that the people weren't smart enough to choose their leader. It was that in the time, at the time of the, the late 18th, 18th century, there was no communications network. There were only a few newspapers. There was no transportation network. People lived and, and worked very close to home and they just couldn't possibly know or be expected to know about politicians and lawmakers and leaders outside of their local area. So the expectation was that everybody would vote for their local guy and that what would end up happening was nobody would get enough votes to win. So one idea was, okay, we need some sort of intermediary body of people who know more about these candidates for what will be a national political office. And that was a real concern, and that is one of the animating factors behind the adoption of this system, which we call the Electoral College. They didn't call it that. Uh, there's no, the Electoral College as a phrase does not exist in the Constitution. But another factor that I think we really have to grapple with, as we have started to in so many other areas of our life, is race and slavery, and the role that slavery, and in particular, the protection of the interests of the slaveholding states played in every major compromise at that convention. We know well that the, the House of Representatives was created uh, with a, a promise of three-fifths, the three-fifths clause promised re extra representation for the southern states based on their slave populations. So these people that they hold in bondage who have no human rights whatsoever still count 
for three fifths of a person when it comes to representation in the national legislature. That makes a huge difference. It ends up in the first decades of the, of the country leading to all kinds of legislation, all kinds of leadership, the, the speaker of the house, the president, uh, is, uh, is a Virginia slaveholder for, I think, 36 of the first 40 years of the country, uh, the, 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 the justices of the Supreme Court, all of these factors are affected by that three-fifths clause. In fact, the Northerners were furious about it. They called it the slave power. And they insisted, I think, with good evidence that Thomas Jefferson in 1800 was elected president on the basis of that slave power because the South had extra votes in uh, in the, for the presidency, based on their extra, uh, their, 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 their extra representation in Congress, Thomas Jefferson got those extra votes and became the president. So I think one of the things that we really need to remember and to, to keep coming back to is the role of race and the role of white supremacy in particular and the maintenance of white political domination that shaped the Electoral College and then continued to play itself out through the development and adaptation and evolution of the Electoral College for the last 230 plus years. So just to get to the very end of the, that first part of the story, the framers adopt this system of choosing the president in the early days of September. It was a, a committee called the Committee of Unfinished Parts. <laughs> and this is, they were hammering out really literally the last details of what we now know of as the constitution. And they adopt a system whereby every state gets a number of electors. And these are human beings who are chosen within each state uh, to vote for the president and the vice president. And the number of electors a state gets is equal to its representation in Congress. So that means it's number, however many members it has in the House of Representatives, plus its two senators. So that's why I say that this, this three-fifths clause, which gave the Southern states extra political power in Congress, also gave them extra political power in choosing the president because they get more electoral votes for their slaves. So they hammer that out, they sign the document, uh, they send it off to the states, the states ratify it, and you start to have elections. Well, how did that work out? The first election, everyone knew George Washington was gonna be president. And that's another important part of this story is that the framers who were there in Philadelphia knew that whatever method they chose for electing the president, George Washington was gonna be that man. And so it, the stakes weren't as high as they might seem to us today. George Washington is elected unanimously on the first ballot of the electors in 1789. He is reelected in 1792 in the same way. And then in the fall of 1796, George Washington says, I'm done. I've been trying to retire for decades. Please let me go home. They finally say, go home, George. He, go, he goes, he retires to, uh, to Virginia. And suddenly we have something that has never happened before, which is a contested partisan presidential election. 1796 is the first election in which you have two parties. Uh, there were not political parties even 10 years earlier when the founders were talking about what kind of a, a system they wanted to design. So the constitution makes no accommodation for the existence of political parties. They just weren't a thing, certainly not at the national level. Now in 1796, you have two parties. You have the Federalist Party, uh, which is the party of John Adams and the nationalists like uh, you know, uh, like George Washington and, and Alexander Hamilton. And then you have uh, the Democratic Republicans, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, this group, uh, who are more focused on the interests of the states. That is the, that, that is the basis of how the Electoral College changed completely from what the founders thought that it would be to what it now is today. The, the, the Electoral College as it operated in 1796 is in many important ways, the same as the Electoral College we have today, and it is not the one that the framers thought they were designing. Why is that? Because if you select a body of electors who are in theory supposed to make this sort of deliberative, thoughtful decision about who will be the leader of the country, that doesn't accommodate the idea of competing parties. Though In, the, in that case, the electors would be people who Aren't, don't have any affiliation, who don't have any allegiance to a party. And yet in 1796, you had electors who were beholden to the Federalists and you had electors who were beholden 
to the Democratic Republicans. And they started voting in that way. They weren't voting for the person that they thought would be best to run the country. They were voting for their guy, their team's guy. And that shaped the modern electoral college. Now, let's move forward to the 21st century. And this is the second part of my point, which was uh, the electoral college doesn't operate the way that you think it does today. Most of us sort of assume that the electoral college is a, is a thing that exists in the constitution and that's how the president is elected. And that's actually a, a misunderstanding of what the electoral college is. The electoral college within the constitution is actually a pretty bare bones mechanism. It has uh, the, the detail that I just uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, it says states will get a number of electors equal to their representation in Congress. Beyond that, however, almost all the important elements and features of the college that we know today and that we think about as the electoral college today are not in the constitution. They are the decision of state legislatures. State legislatures have almost total control over how to run the electoral college. And there's two ways in which that control manifests most obviously and most importantly for our choosing of the president. One of them is who gets to pick the electors and the other one is how those electors get awarded to the candidates. Let me go over those two uh, ideas uh, uh, separately because I think they're both really important. And then I think we can start to get into some of the questions. So the, the who, who picks the electors? Today, we assume it's just second nature that the people themselves, right? Uh, citizens like you and me go to the polls, we vote for president. Obviously, yes, it's channeled through the electoral college, but we, we, we vote, we vote and we, we pick a Democrat or Republican or a third party candidate when we, when we go into the ballot box. That was not the assumption at the founding. In fact, you and I have no constitutional right at all to play any role in the election of the president. That right is conferred upon us by our state legislatures. The state legislatures could decide completely consonant with the constitution to award the electors themselves with no consideration of what the voters of their state want, what the citizens of their state, the residents of their state want. And in the early years of the Republic, many states did that. Now states started to, as, as sort of the nation democratized and as we started to see in a, a gradual expansion of the franchise, first to non-landowning white men, then uh, you know, uh, after the uh, Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments, to uh, former slaves, uh, African-Americans, then uh, in the early 20th century to women, uh, then in the later 20th century to younger uh, people, people under the age of 21. That arc of democratization is beginning in the earliest years of the Republic. And it is, it is a crucial component of how the Electoral College starts to change. So as states start to realize, oh, I think the people actually would like to vote directly for their leader. We are, after all, a representative democracy. It becomes hard for other states not to fall into line because people start demanding that right when they see that other states have it. By 1828, I believe it might be 1832, every state but one elects its electors by a popular vote of all eligible voters in the state. South Carolina is the lone holdout. Not since 1876, when Colorado's uh, legislature chose its three electors uh, in its very first uh, 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 go round in the uh, presidential race, that was the year that Colorado was admitted to the union. Not since that year in 1876, has a state legislature chosen electors um, and, and, uh, you know, and disregarded that, the will of the people. So in a funny way, I think it, it, you could say, you know, we talk about, should we have a national popular vote? Or should we have an electoral college? Uh, in fact, we have a national popular vote right now. And we have for more than 150 years, the people themselves, all eligible, eligible voters everywhere in America have cast a ballot for president for 150 years and more in most, in most states. The only reason we don't count the vote that way is because of the other part of what states can do with their electoral with their electors, which is the how those electors get awarded. The way that almost all states today, all but two states, award their electors is through something called a winner-take-all rule. 
This has gone by different names throughout history, but today we call it the winner take all rule and it means exactly what it sounds like, which is your state awards all of its electors to the candidate who wins the most votes in the state. It doesn't matter how many votes that candidate wins. They don't have to win a majority of the vote. They don't have to win by any certain margin. They could win by a single vote and get all of the state's electors and everybody else is shut out. Now, this winner take all rule is at the heart of the, of the most distorting effect of the modern electoral college and the most, what I believe, most corrosive political and governance uh, effects of the electoral college. And that's because what it does is it effectively erases the votes of tens of millions of Americans just because of the happenstance of where they live. Democrats who live in Texas, it might as well not exist. Republicans who live in California might as well not exist. Republicans who live in Massachusetts might as well not exist. All of those people are shut out of the process before the actual vote for president happens, which is the electoral the meeting of the electors in December. It's that like those people, maybe close to 100 million Americans don't exist. And the, the reason that's so bad is when, when presidential candidates know that they don't have to worry about appealing to large numbers of Americans, they focus on extremely narrow slivers of the country in order to win. And that's what we call battleground states, right? So the winner take all rule creates these two different kinds of states, battleground states and safe states. Safe states, which are most states in the country, 40 to 45, depending on the year, are states that no amount of campaigning, no amount of pleas from a candidate will change the, the outcome of the vote. That We know that the Republican or the Democrat is going to get the most votes in that state and therefore win all of that state's electors. It's only the battleground states that matter. It's only in those states where a little bit of extra campaigning or a little bit of tweaking your, your, your party platform to satisfy the interests of the voters in those states could actually shift a few thousand votes one way or the other, and therefore all of that state's electors. We watched that happen just a few months ago, right? In Georgia, for example, Georgia was decided by, I think it was around 11 or 12,000 votes out of 5 million cast. That's a really, really small margin. And both Donald Trump and Joe Biden were rightfully fighting over those votes, right? They really wanted to win those votes because Georgia had 16 electoral votes. That's a big prize. Uh, and so it makes a big difference what you do to win those votes. When, when candidates only have to focus on those states, those battleground states, what it means is they ignore the interests of the vast majority of Americans. Massachusetts, of course, is a safe state and has been for decades. And whatever Massachusetts, Massachusetts voters want doesn't matter to the candidates of either political party because they don't have to worry about it. They know it's going to the Democrat. And that's to me just wrong. It is a perversion of representative democracy. It is a perversion of the governance of a people who are supposed to be represented by someone who, who covers all of them no matter where they live. And that I think is really the heart of the problem and what we need to focus on if we are going to reform the system. The end of my book, I talk about a, an effort that is now underway to, uh, to actually reform the system without amending the constitution. And this is just the last thing I'll say before I, I turn it over to Peter for more of a, of a dialogue, which is there have been close to 800 attempts throughout American history to amend or abolish the electoral college out of the constitution. That is by far more than any other single provision of the constitution. People have not been happy with this system from the start. This is not me, a liberal complaining about a system that you know screwed my two candidates twice in the last 20 years. This is something that people on all sides of the political spectrum have been complaining about for generations. And in fact, we all of those efforts have failed, but one came closer than any other in the late 1960s. And I tell that story in my book, it's an amazing story and we'll get into that in the conversation. Uh, but since that effort, which, which nearly succeeded at abolishing the college and replacing it with a popular vote, um, there has been nothing that has come as close except this effort today, which is an, an, an interstate compact, an agreement among states to change the way they award their electors. Rather than using that winner take all rule, which I've mentioned on the state level, what these states who join this compact agree to do is to award their electors to the winner of the most votes in all 50 states. And so that is a way of, of, of effectively creating a national popular vote because this agreement only kicks in when states 
who, who, who represent together a, to, a, a majority of electoral votes. That's 270. That's what you need to win to become president. When states representing 270 electoral votes join that compact and all of them agree to say, we're gonna give our electors, not to the winner of our statewide vote, but to the winner of the vote in all 50 states combined, automatically the person who wins the most votes becomes the president. What that does is it forces candidates um, in both parties to appeal everywhere because they know they need to win votes everywhere to get the most votes in the country. So that, that, is, uh, that, that compact has been, under, uh, has been uh, in development for about 15 years. It has 15 member states plus the District of Columbia. Uh, they total together 196 electoral votes. That means they are 74 votes away from the compact taking effect, which means if 74 more electoral votes worth of states join this compact, we would be electing the president uh, by effectively a national popular vote. So, uh, you know, that was the past, that's the present, and, and it's the potential future. There's a lot of different material I think we can go into here. Uh, and Peter, I would love to just uh, start to engage with you on, on the various parts of it. Perfect, perfect. Um... That was just uh, an amazing rundown, Jesse. I don't know how you did your whole book in, uh, in this sh such a short order, but you did it well. And uh, before we uh, examine some of these uh, solutions uh, and, and the one you prefer, which uh, actually in the chat, we've had a whole lot of questions about that. I, I wanna focus for a second on why this is so important now. Mm. And it has been important to a lot of people over 200 years. The number of amendments, as you point out in your book, the number of folks that have talked about it has, has, has been amazing. Birch Bayh, uh, who was uh, the father of constitutional amendments, who you know well, and is, is uh, one of his aides who wrote a biography of him, I believe is on this, on this call with us, uh, Bob Blameyer. Uh, you know, talked a lot about the effort that, that Birch by and others made uh, in, in, in many years ago. But right now, you know, people would say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really matter because usually this, you know, you win the popular vote, you win the electoral vote. And, you know, there are a few instances where things were a little fuzzy. And oh, by that way, by the way, that business of no one and getting the 270, uh, that House of Representatives thing is really, really bad, but right. we, we, we don't really want to talk about that because it's so bad. But here's, here's the point I want to make, and I, I want you to talk a little bit about it. Today is March 4th. Today is traditionally the day in the old days when you would inaugurate a president of the United States. Those of us in Washington, D.C. woke up to, to, to scary articles and, and thoughts that the QAnon folks were going to attack the Capitol today because today was when they were gonna inaugurate their president, Donald Trump. Well, you know, aside from what, you know, bringing back these horrendous memories of January 6th, which was all about the electoral college, mm -hmm. you know, this thought that we're not, we're not out of the woods on this yet. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you point out in the book and that statisticians and Pauls like me have concentrated on is, hey, Al Gore won in 2000 by 500,000 votes. He probably would have won Florida if they had a recount, but that, that aside, that was about an even split on the Electoral College. That was, that was a very scary deal. Hillary Clinton won by close to 3 million votes, uh, popular votes, lost the Electoral College. You know, everybody said, oh, that's the way it is, that's the way it is. The problem that I see, and this is where I want you to comment on it, I think this is gonna get worse, a lot worse. You know, your folks at the New York Times said, you know, it's possible that Joe Biden could win this election by 5 million votes and lose the Electoral College. Well, he won by 7 million and he could have lost the Electoral College. Now, at what point do you say, this is crazy? And because people say, oh, the founders came up with it. Listen, the founders came up with women not voting. The founders came up with state legislatures electing senators, not the people. The founders came up with three-fifths. I mean, the founders didn't get it all right here. So the, 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 what, I, what I want you to, to, uh, to talk a little bit about is why right now this is so crucial. Yeah. Why, are why should people really focus on this now? 
Well, thank you for that reminder. And thank you for pulling me into this present moment, because I, I think I can sometimes get lost in the in the other uh, alleyways of my <laughs> of my book. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, not only has uh, twice in the last 20 years, uh, the president, uh, the, the person who won the most votes in the country um, did not become president. It very nearly happened again this year. And I think people didn't appreciate just how close we came to an almost exact replica of 2016. Uh, Joe Biden won the national popular vote by more than 7 million votes. And yet with a switch of roughly 50,000 votes across three states, you know, that's nothing. That's smaller than a college football stadium. Donald Trump would be in his second term right now. 50,000 votes, uh, even though Do Joe Biden wins by more than 7 million votes. Uh, another way to look at it is uh, Joe Biden won the Electoral College by the exact same margin uh, 306 to 232 that Donald Trump won it by in 2016. Donald Trump lost the popular vote by 3 million. Joe Biden won it by 7 million. The same electoral college outcome with a swing of 10 million votes in the country. Something is wrong with the design of our system for electing the president. And I'll say this. <clears throat> so Here's why I think it matters now. And here's why I think it's mattered all along is I think two of the, the most important principles of a representative democracy uh, and of a, of a constitutional republic, whatever you choose to, whatever moniker you choose to use for the system that we designed and that we live under, the two most important principles are political equality and majority rule. Political equality is the idea that all of us, when we enter the ballot box are equals. Nobody's vote counts for more or less than anybody else's vote. We have enshrined that ideal in a, in a phrase called one person, one vote, which the Supreme Court came up with in the early 1960s in a series of cases involving legislative and congressional districting. Uh, the districts in the 1960s were way out of whack, um, and particularly in the Southern states, you had uh, white dominated rural areas with extremely small numbers of people having the same political representation as uh, more racially and ethnically diverse cities with far larger numbers of people. That was a discrepancy that the Supreme Court said could not stand under the Constitution's promise, uh, implicit promise of one person, one vote, political equality. The Electoral College as it operates today violates political equality. It violates one person, one vote because people's votes count differently depending on where they live. The Supreme Court actually speaks to this specifically in that line of cases in the early 1960s. They say a, a man's vote, they say a man's vote cannot be made to depend on where he lives. And yet, they have to accept the existence of the Electoral College, which they acknowledge violates that principle because they say it's in the Constitution. What can we do about it? <laughs> Their point basically being, if you don't like the Electoral College, you amend the Constitution. We don't write the thing, we just interpret it. The other key principle here is majority rule. And this is the one that I think for most people is the real visceral insult. The, the one that most people understand in their gut. Uh, which is the violation of majority rule. We are raised from children to understand that the bigger number beats the smaller number. That's how it works in every area of life, except golf. And that's, that's what we understand to be the essence of fairness, right? Donald Trump, I have a quote in, my, in uh, uh, the inside jacket of my book, the electoral college is a disaster for a democracy. That quote is from Donald Trump. He tweeted that on election night 2012. Why would he tweet that on election night 2012? It's because he thought briefly, based on some early returns, that Mitt Romney, his candidate, the Republican, was going to win the popular vote. He was going to win the most votes in the country, and yet he was going to lose the Electoral College to Barack Obama. That pissed him off. And all I can say is, amen, brother. I feel you. <laughs> I feel your pain, as they say. Right. I, and that's exactly what was going on in 2000. People thought the odds were that Al Gore would get the most electoral votes, but would lose the popular vote to, to Bush, partly because of Texas, partly because of a lot of things. Right. L let me raise another thing here, which, which I think is terribly important. I think what's happening uh, now is the Electoral College is increasing polarization in this country. I think you have a situation now where people are, their zip code depends upon how they're gonna vote in a lot of cases. You just look at where they're from. And this is, someone asked about it in the chat, the rural urban so-called mm -hmm. split. 
Yeah. And, and what we've got is a situation where, uh, you know, the redder states get redder and the bluer states get bluer and the candidates don't feel like they have to compete in those states. It right. used to be in advertising, which is my field. In the old days, what you do is you blanket the country with your ads in a presidential campaign. You'd buy spots on the national news or on national shows. Now you don't do that. Why would you spend all that money? You go into Akron, Ohio, if you need to, or, you know, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and you and that's where you put your money. So you don't, I mean, if I'm a Democrat, why am I buying time in Boise, Idaho? Not, not, not a smart move. Why do I campaign in Boise, Idaho? Look, the reason John Kennedy probably won the election in 1960 was that foolishly, Richard Nixon said, I'm going to all 50 states. And he spent the last weekend or whatever in Alaska. I mean, he, you know, he lost by 125,000 votes. It, it, it was pretty close to the darn deal. But, but my point on this is that it's, a, it, it, it's getting worse and worse. Yeah. And the more that we uh, rely on it, um, and the fewer states that are actually in play with this electoral college situation, you know, rural voters aren't going to get any attention. Yeah. You know, big cities, you know, you, you know, as you point out in your book, you know, California, Democrats going to California, that's to use California as an ATM. I mean, that's to get the money out of California. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and if you look at some of these numbers, three million votes for Hillary Clinton winning, the margin in California was three million votes. Well, let me... Let me Oh, yeah, so sorry. We, no, no, no. Go ahead. I mean, so, I just... so no, no. I absolutely agree. By the way, Richard Nixon was the last candidate of either party to uh, visit <laughs> all fifty states. Play. Um, but here's here is the here is the thing about this winner take all rule that I that I touched on earlier, and what makes it so corrosive. This whole discussion that we're having is all the artifact of the winner take all rule. That map that we look at on election night and that we all fretted over for weeks before election day. That blue, red and blue map, that is an artifact of the winner take all rule. I know you, we all know this, but it's really important to reiterate it because states are not red states or blue states. It's a meaningless, it's a meaningless distinction. It's saying that it's- It should be a meaningless distinction. But, but, the problem we've got now is that you're not gonna have these situations where, look, 1988, the two, uh, the two states that people were really concerned about that were in play that they thought, you know, both sides thought they could win were New Jersey and California. Uh, <laughs> don't think so anymore. But right. you know, the other point about this is, and the reason I say this is polarizing in red state, blue state a little bit, the, you're not helping down ballot folks. You're not helping members of Congress. You're not helping uh, you know, have real competition when, 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 when presidential campaigns don't campaign in those states. The, yes. the, the one thing I'd like you to talk about, uh, Jesse, which I think is so important because it's what you know, people are asking about in the chat and it's what people are talking yeah. about is, is to say, look, okay, fine. Why don't we just do, and you deal with it very well in your book, terrifically in your book. Um, why don't we just do it proportionally? Yeah. So you got you know, 50 uh, electoral votes and it's a 50-50 state and each person gets 25 electoral votes. Yep. Why not do it? That's the one solution people throw out. The yep. second is do it by congressional district. So yep. you win a congressional district, you win those electoral votes out of those districts. So yep. go to those and then, then we'll go to this, the solution that, that a little more in depth that you raised at the end. Sure. The, those two proposals, the um, proportional allocation of electors and the con uh, allocation by congressional district are the two most commonly proposed. They're the ones that come up the most often. And I think it's sort of telling that people uh, uh, suggest them so often because I think it shows that nobody's happy with winner take all. Nobody thinks winner take all is a good idea. As soon as you kind of shift people away from this, I think mis misguided debate about what did the founders want and you know you know what was the, this, the brilliant electoral college and constitution is. No, how does it operate today? And what do people actually think about that? Nobody defends the winner take all rule when they're confronted with it. So they say, okay, well, yeah, I agree with you. That's a bad way to do it. So let's do it a different way. So proportional allocation is, uh, the, is the one that comes up most often because that just seems so sensible. Um, there, in theory, 
proportional allocation could work pretty well. It would get you, it could get you a, about as close as possible uh, to a uh, popular vote outcome without eliminating the electoral college. And the way that would work is what's called and forgive me for the technical terms here, but it's called fractional proportional allocation. If you could divide electoral votes by fractions, uh, maybe out to two, three, four decimals, you really could get a pretty accurate representation of the country. Now you would still have a skew that was based on the Senate. Remember, every state gets two electors for its senators. So small states get proportionally more power in the choosing of the president than bigger states. Wyoming gets the same two electors that California gets, even though Wyoming only has 170th the population of California. Um, now, in the system we have now in the winner take all system, that effect is essentially erased. It's, an effect, it's essentially a meaningless effect. Uh, people often think, oh, the small states benefit from the electoral college. They don't benefit from the electoral college. They're ignored just like the big states are because with the exception of one, New Hampshire, small states are all safe states. They're either democratic or they're Republican. So small states have no coherent interest that they share to keep the electoral college. In, if you had a proportional uh, system, uh, then th that, that uh, influence would be greater. I still think it would be better than what we have now. However, here's the problem. You can't have a proportional allocation. Uh, you can't have a fractional proportional allocation because the constitution says electors are human beings and you can't cut human beings into little pieces. Therefore, you would have to amend the constitution to use that method. And then you get back into the problem of amending the constitution. Yeah, and, 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 you know, that's, you know, at some stage, you know, folks may get to that point but but uh, but and we'll talk about your solution a little bit more in yeah. a second. But one of the things you know I I, I want to raise here is that one of the arguments against some of the solutions is that you know we have a two party system. It seems to work you know fairly well, and occasionally we get folks in there. We get George Wallace winning forty six electoral votes, which didn't change the outcome in sixty eight, but it could have. We have folks like Ralph Nader getting in there, taking votes away from folks. And would this encourage sort of a free for all, kind of what the founders were kind of a little worried about at the beginning. Right. And you have all these candidates and somebody wins um, with 30, you know, 5%, 30% of the vote and they're not right. really the majority candidate. Right. So one of the people in, in the chat raises this question which you deal with a little bit in the book and which I happen to favor, I think Massachusetts may have just voted for it, which is ranked choice voting. Yeah. So if you needed to, right, you could say, hey, okay, you vote for your first choice, then you vote for your second choice and you could go third, whatever it is. Yeah. But then stuff begins to, and you have a much, much more equitable situation yeah. if it ever came to that. So that's the I'm way of knocking that down, I think. I'm right? a yeah, I'm a huge fan of ranked choice voting and I think it's a really one of the best uh, reforms and one of the best innovations um, around. And I, I think it would make it, I, I know that certain uh, jurisdictions in Massachusetts have adopted it. Uh, I think the entire state of Maine adopted it for this year's presidential race. They actually ran their presidential uh, election and all statewide elections using ranked choice voting. Um, yeah. And it really does solve that problem. It, 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 it eliminates the, the spoiler problem that you referred to, the George Wallace problem, the Ralph Nader problem, the Jill Stein problem, whereby right. because it's all, it's called, what we have is called a first past the post system. Right. Uh, it creates this situation where people are forced into a terrible choice. They have to either, you know, uh, 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 vote for the, the candidate that they really want and and then hurt probably the candidate they would choose second uh, or, you know, vote for someone they just really don't want to vote for. And what ranked choice voting does is it allows people to express their political preferences with a lot more clarity, accuracy, and nuance. And yet it, and it still allows for the winner to receive a majority support, which is really the, the key concern that you're addressing here is what happens if a, a winner of an election walks away with maybe 25, 30% of the vote. And I think it's a legitimate concern if you're talking about yeah. candidates winning that small. However, I think it's also important to look at um, the closest analog that we have to what a popular vote election would be like, which is gubernatorial elections. Those are elections in which the race for the leadership of the jurisdiction is uh, all, all votes in that jurisdiction count. They all count equally and the person who gets the most wins. So you could say, well, 
in, in gubernatorial elections, doesn't that happen all the time? Does it, isn't there a free for all and the winner of the race gets 20% of the vote? Actually, in about 95% of all governor's races for the last, I think, 75 or 80 years, the candidate has gotten over 45% of the vote, the winning candidate. And in, uh, I'm sorry, has gotten over 98% of the vote. Uh, I, I'm sorry, over, <laughs> I'm, I'm messing up my statistics here. In 95% in of the cases, the winning candidate has gotten a majority of the vote. And I think in 98% of the cases, they've gotten at least 45% of the vote. So actually people, there's something uh, that I talk about in the book called Duverger's Law, which is, which is for political scientists is, is something they all know about. And I won't go into the details here, but the essence of it is that having uh, a two party system actually encourages, uh, you actually end up with, um, uh, uh, majority winners or close to majority winners. However, to the extent that that is a concern, and I think it's a legitimate one, ranked choice voting is a great solution. Yeah, and and I was very uh, very quickly corrected by Jay Kaufman and T Tim Jacoby, who said, actually, Peter, you've been in Washington too long. Oh, they didn't say that. They said, actually, I guess Massachusetts did not pass the ranked choice voting. Maybe it exists in some parts of it, but right, and, and that's I think Cambridge too bad. might have it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 was, uh, I was not correct about that. But here, here's, the, here's the real question uh, I think that we're, we're going to be faced with. And somebody actually raises the, uh, the point here uh, about has the New York Times editorial board uh, embraced uh, uh, some of these uh, ranked choice voting and, and, and some of the solutions that oh, you, yeah. you propose. So uh, I'll leave that as the question number one. But question number two is go through a little bit the pluses and minuses of the compact and yeah. how that would work. And also, you know, there are some would say, and you pointed out in the book, some constitutional questions. And with this Supreme Court is currently constituted. Yeah. You know, where would they go on, on your on your so, idea? So we've editorialized repeatedly in favor of the rank of ranked choice voting, uh, both in our in New York City, where it was not where it was adopted uh, in our last election for all municipal, I believe for all municipal elections um, and also nationwide. The other let me just say before I get into your to answer your question about the compact, the other really significant reform that could happen is one that doesn't get talked about almost ever in public or political life, but would be completely transformative and it would be even easier to do than the Electoral College. And that is expanding the size of the House of Representatives. Right. This is something I get into in the book. I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with the issue now because uh, it's incredible that we live now with a rep House of Representatives that was locked in, in, in its, at its current size in 1911. So at a time when the nation was one third the size that it is now, we still have the same sized House of Representatives. That was a political choice. That is an arbitrary number. There is nothing constitutional about it. In fact, James Madison's first First Amendment, not the First Amendment we know, the Free Speech Amendment, James Madison's first attempt at a First Amendment was actually to tie forever and ever <laughs> the size of the House of Representatives to the population of the country. And it nearly passed. It was ratified by uh, all, but by one one state shy, it missed ratification, and did not become the First Amendment. And instead, we have the First Amendment we have today. Um, and, so, and isn't it true that it, that you know one of the problems if you're a, a congressperson now, yeah, you know you you just get this bigger and bigger and bigger constituency to service. Right, it's very difficult to do. So, and so you turn into, you know, this business of going door to door or personal. Now you got to be here a media mogul. And, and I guess what it was, it was one third of, of, of what it is now. So you would probably have what, 1,500 or so members of Congress, would you? If, if yeah, you so, 1911. Uh, Depending on right, if you were to use the, if you were to use the ratio that it was in 1911, yes, it would be in that ballpark now. Um, now, a, a single representative uh, represents about, on average, 750,000 right. people, right. and that's an insanely large number. Remember, just just for comparison, the framers put it at uh, 30,000 to one. <laughs> so. Uh, they couldn't have conceived of a country this big. And part of the problem when you have a, rep a House of Representatives this small is that it isn't actually representative. Um, states should, cer certainly states with bigger populations should have more representatives in them compared to smaller states in order to properly reflect where people live. And this is not an idle or kind of academic concern. In fact, 
a changed House of Representatives, a larger House of Representatives would have changed the outcome of the presidential election in several recent elections. If you had a bigger, if everybody voted the same, but states had different numbers of representatives and therefore different numbers of electoral votes, you would have had a different president. That's certainly true in 2000 with Al Gore. Uh, I would have to check the numbers in 2016, but this is a big deal. All they have to do is pass a law to change it. They could do this tomorrow. You know, if Chuck Schumer wanted to and, and he could get Joe Manchin on board, I don't know, maybe tell Joe Manchin, we'll give you a few extra representatives and Joe will say, sure, let's get rid of the filibuster and let's try, let's expand the House of Representatives. But this is something else we've editorialized about at the Times, uh, which is an expanded house is a more representative house and a more representative house is I think a house that governs better in relation to what the American people want, what a majority of American people want, which is I think what the government is there to do. Um, the Senate will always be there. You might add a state or two, but the Senate is fundamentally the Senate. It is going to have those discrepancies and those uh, the, the lack of uh, uh, political equality is, is the essence of the Senate. I don't like it. A lot of people don't like it, but we're not changing it. It's 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 Look, basically uh, locked into the constitution. Forever. We're lucky to have a popularly elected senators. I mean, they, you know that. Well, right. So, but you know, I will say this, and I think this is terribly important. We get off on a little tangent here, but you and I talked about it before uh, tonight, and that is the Senate doesn't work anymore. Right. The Senate doesn't work the way it worked when I was there. I mean, when, when Frank Church wanted to do legislation, he would say, okay, Peter, who are we gonna get on the Republican side to co-sponsor this bill? Right. Bring in these folks. And folks worked across the aisle and even on, uh, on, on some of these incredibly big issues. The, the filibuster was unbelievably screwed up when they, when they so-called reformed it. I mean, it's not, it's not a filibuster anymore. And what we're dealing with is minority rule. And yep. to, to your central point about the Electoral College, what we are going to be potentially dealing with what we have is minority rule. And, 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 you know, once that stuff starts to go, democracy suffers, in my view, big time. So, you know, are there problems? You know, if you, if you get rid of the filibuster, yeah, there are some problems. But are they like the problems we're dealing with now? Joe Manchin could sink practically everything. Mm -hmm. in this in the, in the in that the democrats want to do uh, on a on a reconciliation uh, for but but at any rate we don't need to yep. go totally no, I, but, but let's I go back to because yeah, i i didn't let you answer the other part of the question where would the supreme court go on this and what happens if somebody changes their mind in a state right. who's 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 signed uh, on so, to the compact so the compact is a really interesting idea it's it, it was created by this computer scientist named john Coza who lives in northern california uh, he's an interesting guy. I spent a whole chapter <clears throat> talking about how he created it. He came up with the idea uh, a few years after the last split election in 2000. So I think 2003 or four. <clears throat> and then he, he, he actually goes to Washington. They, they kind of go around Washington talking to people and they, they, get, they get enthusiasm about it from both Democrats and Republicans. So they started up. Maryland is the first state to uh, adopt the compact in 2007. In fact, it was Jamie Raskin, a state lawmaker then, who introduced it and sponsored it. Jamie Raskin is a wonderful man. I, I quote him at length in my book. I think a lot of Americans were introduced to him through uh, the impeachment trial uh, in January or February, <clears throat> but he's really a remarkable, uh, a remarkable person, a remarkable legislator. Uh, he, when he, he's now in Congress, but when he was in the Maryland State uh, House, he, he sponsored this as his first piece of legislation. Um, and, uh, and it's really caught on. It's, it's, it's been adopted, as I said, by 15 states plus DC. Um, the problem is all of those states are what we call blue states. Again, these states have millions of Republicans in them, but they had democratic leadership when they passed them. No state with Republican leadership has yet passed this compact because of the reasons I think we've talked about, which is it looks today like a partisan dispute. It looks like the Electoral College as it's constituted today benefits Republicans, hurts Democrats. So Democrats obviously want to change it. Republicans obviously want to save it. Now I argue in the book at length that that is actually not really accurate, even though yes, it happened twice in the last 20 years, that in some ways there was a fluke and it could, and it could also work against Republicans. So, Jesse, I, I think it will. Yeah. If you look at the demographics of America, look okay. at the direction that they're going. Um, you know, uh, 
you, you could have Texas, even though it didn't turn out this time. Texas goes Democratic. Florida, look, all the old people down there who are conservatives and 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 they were they were Reagan voters when they were thirty uh, and forty years old. They, the, the newer ones, the newer old people in twenty years are going to be Democrats. North Carolina could go Democratic. Virginia's already gone Democratic. You know, my sense of this is, if I were a Republican looking at this long term, I would say first of all, do what's right, yep. because it, do what's fair. Do one person, one vote. Come on. But secondly, I'd say, hey, guys, we're going to be in trouble 2040, 2050, when this country is, is majority, um, uh, um, as they say now, minority. But, it, you know, it, it, you think the number of it, we're going to have his, more Hispanics voting, African-Americans are going to vote. And, and maybe you, you, you'll do better with them, you know, by then. But I, I just think it's short sighted. And, and it's not and it's just not right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's it's voter. It's well, voter and it's just not right. I've come to the realization that <clears throat> political parties are going to do what's in their self-interest and not not do necessarily what's right. So the so the question is how do you how do you appeal to both parties' self-interest here in a way that does the right thing for the country as a whole? I think the the Texas example is the best one. Is that Texas is the biggest electoral pot outside of California? Thirty-eight electoral votes, more than ten percent of what you need to become president is in Texas alone. Texas is moving toward the blue side of the ledger. Um, you know, and people were talking about it happening in, in 2020. I always felt like that was a little premature. I wasn't really like sold on the case for why it was going to happen. But the fact that we were even talking about it should have terrified Republicans, right? The fact that Texas could go for the Democrats, if Texas goes to the Democrats, Republicans have no path to, to the electoral college, to an electoral college victory, none at all. And once that happens, they've got to figure out how do we get the presidency back? And, and, and I think this issue of polarization that you talk about is a really important one in that regard, because I think the way the Electoral College functions today, it really, really amplifies these, no, these ideas of polarization. I actually think the country might, there might be a lot more moderation than we think there is. And people are kind of primed to think in red and blue uh, blocks because that's what we see visually and the visual representation over and over again, I think really affects our interpretation of how this country actually exists politically. I actually think, yes, there is a divide between urban and rural. It is extreme, but ju just consider these numbers. The country is almost evenly divided among four groups, urban, uh, suburban, uh, exurban and small towns, and then rural. Is 20, uh, roughly close to 25% in each of those groups. The urban is about uh, the uh, is about 60, 40 votes for Dem Democrats and the rural is about 60, 40 votes for Republicans. That is almost a complete wash. So this whole side argument about how you, have, you get rid of the electoral college and suddenly only New York and California are gonna decide the election. I don't know where people came up with that, but it's not true. <laughs> New York and California don't have close to enough people to, to decide a national election. And in fact, all the big cities don't have close to enough people. They are essentially erased by the rural areas. So the election is really decided in those in that middle 50%, the suburbs, which lean more towards the Democrats, and the exurbs and small towns, which lean more towards the Republicans. And a few points this way or that will decide the outcome of an election. That is not as polarized a country as I think a lot of people have, have been led to believe. And so I think that sort of the nuance of that is something that politicians who want to run the country should have to grapple with. They shouldn't be able just to say, I'm going to win the I-4 corridor in Florida, or I'm going to win the suburbs of Columbus, Ohio, or now, what is it? I'm going to win the suburbs of Milwaukee or Atlanta or whatever it may be. Like, sure, those places matter, but they don't matter more than the rest of us. Everybody's vote should count equally. That's the essence of the, the idea. And I do think People from both parties feel that way. As soon as their candidate gets hurt by it, they realize how unfair the system is. I yeah, actually, I'm sorry, gonna, um, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say that uh, there's a couple of questions here too uh, about some of this. Um, one is about the electors and could state legislatures really gum up the works with, uh, with selecting electors. And yeah. one of the things that I think we did see in a very scary way, especially especially in Pennsylvania, and uh, was the possibility 
that 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 they would uh, they would muck around in this and 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 change it. And and one of the things I think is terrifying about the events. Well, I'm going to put my Democrat hat on here. I hate to say it, but uh, you know, is that uh, we've seen this undermining of basic democratic values and democracy. And 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 you know, should we have a situation where it actually was a very close election and oh, things yeah. were difficult to figure out in some of these uh, states and with 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 the elections because everybody is running their own elections in every state, as we all know. You you know you've got you've got some serious problems and 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 so it seems to me that to avoid that it's a heck of a lot easier to go with a direct popular vote. The other point that I will I will make and we're working on it at the Frank Church Institute. We're we're doing a lot of work in rural areas there. We're doing focus groups and some surveys and we're dealing with with a, a wonderful two senator from from uh, from uh, Montana, John Tester, who's written a great book called Grounded, because if the Democrats can't figure out how to talk to rural voters, they got a serious problem. If the Republicans can't figure out how to talk to suburban, exurban, you know, uh, 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 voters, Idiot. they got a serious problem. And somebody asked about what's the difference between suburban and exurban, and there's a big difference. I mean, fortunately for the Democrats, they did quite well in both environments. But, the, you know, in previous elections, exurbs, were a little bit more conservative. They weren't rural, but they were kind of, they were kind of, uh, they were definitely up for grabs. But, uh, you know, I, I think that if we're talking about unifying the country, we have a lot of ways to do it. But, but, uh, but, but dealing with this problem, yeah, or so, it blows up in our face is, is, to, is to, really important. To answer the, the question, um, I believe that in, at least in the, in, in the statistic that I looked at that I just gave about 25% uh, in, e in each of these four uh, buckets, uh, urban, uh, it, it, the measure, the, the definition is by how many people live within a five, minute, uh, five mile radius of you. Uh, and if it's more than 250,000, it's urban. If it's between uh, 250,000 and 100,000, it's suburban. If it's between, I think, 25,000 and 100,000, it's exurban or small town, and if it's below 25,000, it's rural. So, you know, those are obviously, that's a, it's a rough way of, of delineating, but it's a, it's a useful way, I think, to, to look at population density as being related to political um, valence. Uh, you know, just, just to sort of tie up the, the loose end there on the, on the um, compact, I, I was saying how no Republican state has yet adopted this, and that's a problem for the compact. I think, A, because they just need more states to join it. Um, they need 74 more votes worth of states, uh, but also because of just the way that it looks. I mean, I think if we're going to change the way that we elect the president of the United States, it would be good if it were, uh, if it appeared to be a bipartisan effort. Now, the, the, compact, the compact people themselves are actually a bipartisan group. There are Democrats and there are some very strong conservatives on there, Trump conservatives, in fact, uh, whom I interviewed for the book. And they, they, they agree on nothing <laughs> except for this. They all agree on this. And so they all go and work with and try to convince lawmakers in different states to try to, to adopt this compact because that's their audience as state lawmakers. Uh, the Democrats go and are, you know, meet with the Democratic lawmakers. The Republicans go meet with the Republican lawmakers because they have different concerns, obviously. And, then, and, and in fact, before the 2016 election and before Donald Trump won while losing the popular vote, uh, three Republican-led states actually were very close to passing this compact. Um, I think it was Georgia, Arizona, and Utah. And they didn't do it. Uh, after the election, everybody kind of jumped back and ran back into their partisan corners. Uh, but it shows that there was a lot of Republican interest in a system that was more equitable, that was fairer, that did that was based on one person, one vote, because Republicans were starting to feel like, when are we going to win the Electoral College again? And Barack Obama had just, you know, easily won it the, the last two times. And you know, Hillary Clinton, I think, but for some flukes, uh, uh, probably uh, was was clearly on track to win it too. So um, I think it's important to remember that this can be a bipartisan effort. It can be a, bi a bipartisan approach to a popular vote. 
The problem is right now, it does feel very partisanized. Uh, and then with regard to the question about uh, constitutionality, there will be, if the, if the compact reaches 270 electors, uh, there would be challenges. One of them is uh, involves the compact clause of the constitution, which appears on its face to require that Congress consent to any compact among the states. Any interstate compact must be consented to by Congress. It, that's actually not entirely true. The Supreme Court has set out different standards for when Congress needs to consent. And I think there's a very good argument that they don't need to consent in this case. Nevertheless, it, will be, it would be litigated um, I, you know, I think there's a good argument right now that while the Democrats are holding uh, both houses of Congress, they should consent to this co compact. They could do it right now. Um, but I don't know if that's uh, that's probably pretty low on their to do list uh, these days. Um, so so so, I, you know, I'm a I think the compact is a brilliant, clever uh, design. I, I really love how it uh, focuses attention on the winner take all rule at the state level and why that is so distorting. I'm not I'm not here to sell you on the compact specifically or to say it's the only or best solution. I do think it's the most realistic one in this moment when um, the constitutional mechanism of an amendment is so uh, daunting uh, because you need two thirds of both houses of Congress to uh, sign on. And then you also need three quarters of the states. And I just think it's, it's hard to imagine in this moment, anything getting that kind of support. Unlike the filibuster, which they could get rid of tomorrow if they wanted to, uh, you, can't you can't change the requirement right. of two thirds of both houses of Congress for an amendment that's in the constitution. So- uh, and, and, and I think some people who in the past had recommended a constitutional convention for certain things, uh, that, that's oh. just a real can of worms. So that's another, that's another whole, that's another that's another whole lecture. That's another <laughs> whole lecture. I, I will say that I did look up when, when the when the a vote uh, happened in 1979 uh, to get rid of the electoral college, and you needed the 67 votes, of course, it got uh, it got 51, 51 votes yeah. to 48. But th then what I did was I looked up uh, the split party split, and it shows you how things have changed. Yeah. So you had 39 Democrats and 12 Republicans that voted yes. So that's quite a few Republicans, right? Yep. You had 19 Democrats and 28 Republicans that voted no against it. Uh, and, and of course, a, a serious number of those folks were Southern Democrats, because that's, as you've discussed, yeah. that, that was a complete no-no for, yep. for a Southern Democrat. But it was, it was amazing the people that, that, that you wouldn't expect. And uh, you know, Bob Dole, Yep. voted if, uh, to get rid of the Electoral College. I mean, what a surprise. Jake Garn from Utah, as you, you know, you mentioned Utah. Now, then there were moderate liberals, Jacob Javits, Mac Mathias, John Danforth, um, Lincoln Chafee from Rhode Island, Mark Hatfield from Oregon, Durenberger from Minnesota. But, you know, there were some surprise uh, Democrats who voted the other way. Some, they, they small state folks like Joe Biden, for example. Ed Muskie, Paul Sarbanes, Tom Eagleton, Bill Bradley, Moynihan. The big, some of the big states thought their ox was going to get gored, but it was a very interesting yeah. vote. And, was, and of course, what, who was I most interested in? My old boss, Frank Church, because I was right. there. I forgot the vote, and he voted to abolish the electoral college. So I was kind of proud of that. So Chapter five of my book is a really great story, I think, and it's worth reading. It's, it's the retelling of what happened in that era from the late, from the mid 1960s, right after the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act through uh, the effort in the 1970s that you just described to abolish the Electoral College. And, you know, it reaches its pinnacle in 1969 and 1970. Um, Senator Birch Bayh, whom we talked about a few earlier, uh, was the driving force for this amendment. And I think he was really a remarkable, uh, uh, statesman and, and someone who really just sort of connected with the democratic arc, the growing democratic uh, nature of this country. And that was how he sold this. You know, he he came into it as a skeptic. He thought, ah, we, we, we can tweak the Electoral College. We don't want to get rid of it. The founders created it. It was it was it there for a reason. And then he started talking to people and he realized, no, this thing is a disaster. The only solution is get rid of it. So this kind of, you know, centrist, mild mannered, 
a lawmaker from Indiana becomes a kind of a popular vote zealot. And he starts selling people on it and making the case for it. And by the late 1960s, after a couple of years of him doing this, 80% of Americans in a Gallup poll said they supported a popular vote for president. And this wasn't just liberals. This was, you know, the Chamber of Commerce supported it. The American Bar Association supported it. League of Women Voters supported it, right? Across the, and, and as you said, you know, D Republicans, Do Bob Dole, D George H.W. Bush, Gerald Ford, you know, I right. mean, this, this had broad support. And what kills it? You know, they, they actually passed the amendment in the House of Representatives passes overwhelmingly 338 votes to 70. They passed the amendment to abolish the Electoral College, the only time in American history when a, a chamber of Congress has, has a, a voted to abolish the Electoral College. It looks like they probably have support in enough states or close to enough to ratify it. What's the last hurdle? The Senate. Who kills it in the Senate? Not the small states. Yes, there were a few small state senators who, were, who, who voted against it, but there were also small state senators who supported it. It was the Southern segregationists, Strom Thurmond, Jim Eastland, Sam Irvin, who were adamant about maintaining their control, the white dominance of Southern politics. And they had just tried to do the same thing to the Civil Rights Act several years earlier and nearly succeeded. So, you know, they weren't gonna make that mistake again. They killed the filibuster, they, with the filibuster, they killed the Electoral College Amendment and it's never come as close since. That was in September of 1970. It's a really crushing story and Birch Bayh never got over it until the day he died. No, I don't think he did because he got so close. The, the, the other thing is we know timing is everything in politics. Yep. And as you point out in the book, you had that vote in the House and then the Senate had to take up uh, Supreme Court nominations. Yep. And they got going on those and they rejected uh, two Supreme Court nominees. The, uh, the anger, especially amongst some of those Southerners, uh, came to the four plus, yep. it, it took too long. Yep. And this is why, this is, look, this is why yep. the, these folks in the Biden administration right now, they're not fooling around. No. Nope. I mean, they're moving this way because they know that first of all, it's needed right away, but you wait. We waited on the health care reform. It took too long and we could have done it earlier. Yeah. So, you know, th this is the strike while the iron is hot is is, is, is I, I happen to think, Jesse, and I don't know whether you agree with me or not, yeah. but I happen to think that that this will only move when we hit a crisis, yeah. when something really bad happens. And as if January 6th wasn't really bad, but where you have a situation where all, I hate to put it this way, but we're all hell break, breaks loose. And then finally, hopefully cool heads prevail and say, hey folks, we can't do this anymore because it ain't working. Yeah, you know, I feel like all hell broke loose on January 6th. And, and I think a lot of people were very shaken by that. And then a lot of people were, were not. And, it's, and it, it does leave you, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very troubled uh, by, you know, um, and I'm concerned about the future of this democracy. But here's what I'll say. When I, when I open the daily news, when I look at the paper every day, I do often feel a sense of- The New York Daily and, News? Is that what you're talking about? The New York Daily News? I just meant that when I look at the news every day. I know. I'm kidding you. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, I love the Daily News. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, when, when I when I when I read the newspaper when I when I watch the news I do feel a sense of despair um, and it's hard to get past when I go back through American history and I think about all of the obstacles that have been overcome and all of the exclusionary and discriminatory and 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 brutal uh, sorts of practices that we've engaged in and that have since been, uh, consigned to the dustbin of history, I actually feel a lot more hopeful. And I just want to maybe, maybe to, we can close since we're uh, approaching 8.30 here. Uh, I just want to read, um, I want to read uh, a short passage from the introduction of my book, which I think um, gets at this point. <clears throat> um, would, you, would you permit me to uh, do that? Fire away. Okay. So, so I'm going to begin um, in at, this is on page uh, uh, 18. Um, so I've gone through 
basically uh, what we talked about earlier, this sort of the growing, the, the arc of democratization of the country, which obviously was not, has not been perfect. There's been a lot of backsliding. There's been a lot of regression at many points. Obviously the period after reconstruction is probably the worst, but there are, there are many other examples of that. Um, but the expansion of the vote from a country in which, you know, fewer than I think 10 or 15% of people could vote uh, to include first um, non-property owning white men, then to including uh, former slaves to bl the black American citizens, then to, uh, you know, expanding to, as you say, to have people vote directly for the Senate, uh, to have people voting directly for their electors, to having women, uh, half of the adult population being able to vote, um, to uh, 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 enfranchising, making citizens of Native Americans in the early 1920s, uh, to um, allowing 18 year olds to vote. You know, all of these things I think are part of a larger story that the electoral college is also a part of, and it is the next step on this democratization. And here's what I'll say, I write, um, maybe this is the real American exceptionalism. Our nation was conceived out of the audacious world-changing idea of universal human equality. And though born in a snarl of prejudice, mistrust, and exclusion, it harbored in its DNA the code to express more faithfully the true meaning of its founding principles. Over multiple generations, and thanks to the tireless work and bloody sacrifices of millions of Americans, some powerful, but most just regular people who wanted to be treated the same as everyone else, that code has been unlocked and those principles slowly but surely have found expression. So I really think that to me, it's remembering that larger arc that makes me feel hopeful about the future uh, and makes me think that we can reach a moment where all votes in this country really are treated as equal and all people are treated as equal. I, that's a, a great ending, Jesse. And I will say to you that I am also an eternal optimist and I, and I got it from my father and he saw a lot over a lot of years. And, you know, when people got discouraged, he would say, what, you want to go back to 1940, <laughs> Ryanard College, you know, where there were not any gay people. Didn't you know that there were not any gay people where, you know, where if you were if you were black you couldn't buy a house, where if if you uh, you know you, let alone vote, you know where where uh, the country moves basically in the right direction. It takes its time, but uh, but the the long arc of history does bend towards justice. So I I uh, I get a little. Uh, I sometimes get down. I'm too old though to get down for very long. And I take great, uh, you know, uh, great solace from from uh, folks like you who write such great books and explain this all so well and and they're leading the charge. So uh, thanks, congratulations. And I know they're gonna put the book up at the end, but everybody, <laughs> if you haven't gotten it, read it because it's a great book. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I think we've been through the questions, so we're in good shape here. Good. But thanks, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter and Jesse, for your wise words and your <clears throat> helping us remember that the arc of the universe bends towards justice. Those are words from of Theodore Parker, who grew up at First Parish in Lexington. So it's just a wonderful summation of the hope that we have for where we can go, but the hard work we still need to get there. And thank you so much for your your wisdom and for your ability to help us understand more deeply where we are and, and point us in the direction that we might go. So thank you all for attending. It's wonderful to have you. Um, so grateful for the, the family that allowed this, this how lecture to, to continue and for all the people that have been with us tonight. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thanks very much, Anne.